Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, two uh, very good speakers here today. Uh, excited for, for two things. Number one, uh, Jay Parekh is our Structural Heart Disease Fellow, and um, he's graduating soon, so now it's time to present yourself to, to the audience. And uh, I heard that you uh, signed a job now back to Nebraska, right? Um, congratulations, so it's always good to have a job. And then we also have uh, Ed Kopeski. I'm very excited here too, uh, from Boston Scientific. He um, trained at some point at MIT and is developing the coding for the Watchman device. And um, I heard that he's the absolute expert on this because it's his little, yeah, project. So we're gonna hear all about it because we're also excited to hopefully uh, introduce the device and the 40 millimeter device then. Uh, into our practice, a practice that has grown by almost 50% uh, last year for Abbott uh, alone. So very excited to hear about uh, the device and then some ideas about how to handle the uh, post-implant strategies. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, so I'm Ed Kopeski. I'm a research fellow at Boston Scientific in Maple Grove in research and development. Um, I'm a kind of a polymer scientist by background and a chemical engineer. And I come, come at this from kind of a uh, blood uh, material interaction perspective and what can we do to improve the interaction between the device and the blood. And the devices or the, the coating has been coined hemocoat. That's something marketing, our marketing came up with. Um, and surprisingly, it's a very, I think, uh, very straightforward, very accurate description of what the coating does. Hemocompatible coating, hemocoat. It's designed to make the device more hemocompatible, make it interact uh, more favorably with the blood. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. So the, the Flex Pro, you know, it has a couple of other um, added features. There's the 40 millimeter, there's the RO markers. I'm the, I'm and my team have worked on the coating specifically and how to how to coat this device and how to test it in in vivo and in vitro models to, to demonstrate that it has the potential to really help patients. And so, you know, why do we coat it? Just a little bit of, of science here. Um, you know, thrombin is kind of our enemy when it comes to uh, LAAC and, and a lot of other um, devices that, that have issues with device-related thrombus. And Jay is gonna talk a lot about DRT uh, after I talk. I'm just gonna point out that uh, if you keep patients on an oral anticoagulant, whether it be warfarin or a DOAC, you're gonna, you're gonna suppress that thrombin elevation pretty well in the first week or few weeks. And you're gonna probably have a lower risk of DRT. But if you don't put them on an oral anticoagulant, whether you put them on aspirin only, whether you put them on Plavix only, whether you put them on DAPT, there's gonna be more thrombin generation. And so there's gonna be a heightened probably heightened DRT risk in the first few weeks if patients are on uh, only antiplatelets. And so what can we do to the device to make us less reliant on oral anticoagulation post-implant? The thought that my former boss had in 2019, so almost five years ago, was, well, what if we coated the watchman with PVDF? Now, most of you probably don't know what PVDF is, and you know, you, unless maybe you're a, um, an IC, or you, might, you might know its use on, on uh, drug eluting stents as a, a, an excipient. Um, but this was the question, what if we coated the watchman with PVDF? And PVDF, it's a Teflon-like polymer. So it's a fluoropolymer, it's got fluorine, which means it's hydrophobic, more hydrophobic than most polymers. And that's gonna impact how the blood responds to it, how proteins in the blood respond to it, and that acute response to the device will be different if you coat it with this polymer. Key points about it, it's, it's a stable polymer. So it's inert, it's non-active, it's non-eluting, it's not a drug, it, it, is, it is biostable, it's just more hydrophobic than your typical polymers, your typical surface. It's been established on drug-eluting stents, so like uh, the Proma stent from Boston Scientific, the Alluvia peripheral stent, the Zion stent from Abbott, this polymer is used as a, it's, it's used actually as a, with a drug to release the drug. Here we're not using the drug. We don't have no drug in the polymer this time. We're just coating it with the polymer itself. And so really there was no data on this, this polymer coating without drug. 
all the data was on drug looting stents. And so there was always this drug um, component to in interpreting what the impact of this polymer was. And so we really didn't know, is this going to be effective on the Watchman device without a drug? So there's three, three key uh, steps we, we had to go through to develop and assess this. First was develop the coding technology. How do we code it? And then how do we assess the coding on the bench? Then there's the, we get into the animal studies where we test whether it actually heals differently. And then if we see a difference in the healing, why does it heal differently at the kind of cellular level? Starting with the coding technology. So our, our uh, senior fellow, Steve Kangas in Maple Grove came up with a really elegant way to dip coat the, the Watchman Flex device to get this fluoropolymer coating on it. And once, once he'd come up with this way to coat it, he developed a, a blood test method to compare uncoated to coated fabric. And so the uncoated, this would be like your Watchman Flex fabric on the top row, it will develop this thrombus layer within an hour in this blood test, whereas the coated material on the bottom row will resist thrombus for a longer period of time. Now, if you let this test go for two hours, three hours, four hours, the bottom row will thrombose as well, but it takes longer. The response is less severe to the blood when you, when you have the coated material. And then we tested it in, a, in human blood on actual devices for four hours. And the top row is the uncoated and the bottom row is the coated. And what you, you see is this, this one is red, but if you look at the zoomed in, you have thrombus covering, building up on the device. And here you don't really have thrombus building up. You have thrombus forming inside the device where the flow is stagnant, but it's more resistant to growing on top of the fabric. And so when you look at thrombus coverage, it's much lower with the coated device. And this is all well and good, but if you, if you worked in this area long enough, um, I've seen so many coatings that perform like this on the bench that, that don't actually show any benefit once you put it in an animal. You know, uh, once you go in vivo, uh, for example, we've looked at, say, heparin coatings that look even better than this on the bench, but look much, much worse than this when you put it in an animal. And so we had to, you know, this, this is kind of what tells us, okay, this is worth testing, taking the next step, but it doesn't tell us whether it's actually going to make a difference. So we go to an animal study. Does it heal any differently? And so... My question was, what if we implant in a very thrombogenic animal for three days? So this is kind of like an extended in vivo. Um, it's like our blood loop experiment, but longer and more challenging. And so when we compare the uncoated and the coated, these are, these are TEEs in the, uh, the animals. So these are non-anticoagulated dogs. There was a lot of thrombus on the uh, uncoated. There's like even a mobile flap to it, whereas the coated, we didn't really see any thrombus buildup in this, in this study. When we explanted, this is, this is right before sacrifice of the animals. There is this thrombus layer. It's just not visible on the echo. And that's part of normal healing is to get that thrombus layer uh, and that occlusion of the, of the membrane. And the question might be, well, is there any difference between these at the, at the cellular level? I'll get into that a little later. It does look like there's a difference with this coding. This was the first sign that, okay, we may have something here. So why? Why does it heal differently? Well, the question is, and I started alluding to this, is all thrombus created equal? We have thrombus here, we have thrombus here. To your naked eye, to the untrained eye, if you looked at these, would they look any different? If you take away this, this little flap of material that, that looks kind of bad, would you expect there to be any difference at the cellular level? Before we get into that, I'm gonna talk a little about how this coding works with the Watchman device and why we think it works better than we had initially thought. And so the Watchman fabric, it's a polyester, multi-filament yarn. 
and it has, I think, 18 filaments per strand, and it has kind of this cross section here. And so when you dip this fabric into the coating solution, the coating solution wicks in and coats kind of everything, the outer and interior surfaces. And so you actually have, if you had a monofilament structure, you'd have this much surface area. With a multifilament, you have about four times as much surface area, which means if you don't coat it, there's four times as much polyester interacting with the blood. And if you do coat it, you have four times as much fluoropolymer interacting with the blood. This is just to show how the coating, how it wicks up. So this, this polyester fabric piece just was dipped, the very, very tip of it was dipped into this coating solution. And you can see it's, it's already wicked up near the top of the, uh, the fabric piece. So it just pulls all that coating in to every surface. And this is an um, example of, of a, where Steve Kangas had put some fluorescent dye in the coating solution, just a very small amount. And you see how that, that, uh, that dye gets everywhere because of how, how that fabric pulls in the coating. So again, is all thrombus created equal? Well, this, this gets back to that fabric structure. If you look at the uncoated, this is a histology slice from uh, this, this animal's uh, explant. And these are these multi-filament strands of Watchman fabric. And there's a lot of purple dots, a lot of inflammatory cell nuclei associated with this fabric. There's a lot more, there's a lot going on there. And the coated fabric around these coated bundles, it's a lot more benign. You don't see all this purple, just kind of looks pink. And so what we're seeing is more inflammation early with this uncoated, less inflammation here. So there is a difference at the cellular level that is creating this difference in this three-day response. And it gets to that structure, that multifilament structure. And if we had a monofilament, we might not see such a big difference. Now, I've shown you three-day animal data, which still doesn't tell us whether it's fully healing, right? We, didn't, we stopped at three days. There's a thrombus um, covering on both, both the uncoated and the coated. Is it actually going to heal, though, if we go out longer? So we went to 45 days in a follow-up study. We compared, we, we did six uncoated and six coated. And again, no antiplatelets or anticoagulants. And that's key because in our, in our prior Watchman experience with like the Watchman Flex, we always had the, the animals on dual antiplatelet therapy. And DAPT is quite effective in, in dogs. So um, we always had that, we never saw any negative results with the Watchman Flex in, in animal studies because we always had them on DAPT. So we've gone with a very challenging animal model here. And we did TE follow-ups at two weeks, four weeks, and six weeks to look at how much buildup there was on the device. And then we sacrificed the animals at 45 days. And we have the, the two-week TEEs, six uncoated on the left, six coated on the right. And this is at two weeks. And I've highlighted where there's thrombus growth. And this is something you'd never see if the animals were undapped. But you have a lot of thrombus at two weeks in the uncoated. In fact, all of them have significant thrombus growth. Whereas in the coda, there's really only one, that top middle one, that's showing what I would call anything that's beyond just a, a kind of a, a laminar surface coverage. So we go from six of six to one of six with the coating. It's a huge difference. And then what do they look like at, at end of life? Have they healed? That's the key question. Has the healing actually been changed? And in the uncoated, I'd say two of them look, look good. This one looks kind of okay, and then the other three look pretty, pretty gnarly. In the coated, they all look really good. They're all what I would call fully healed. So we, we're kind of two for six and six for six. So at every step, this coating looks significantly better than the uncoated. Okay, you, you look at the, the, the blood loop testing, 
the, um, uh, the three-day dog study where you saw more thrombus and you saw the inflammation in the uncoated. And here in this chronic study, and this is, this is the one that convinced me, that made me a believer, because I was not a believer. I didn't really believe in coatings in general. For I figured you'd coat it and then uh, you'll get a thrombus layer and after the first few hours, everything will even out. There's potential here that we have something. And I think it gets to that structure of that fabric, all that surface area. There's so much more surface area with the Watchman device than say with a drug eluting stent where you have this, this metal structure with very small amount of surface area, frankly. Um, here there's so much surface, there's so much more potential if you make a subtle change in the, the interaction between the blood and the material that you can actually have an impact potentially. And so we, we've done three day studies, we've done 14 day, uh, we actually did a, a 28 day study, a 45 day study. At every stage, the coating looks to be healing in a more controlled manner. Okay, it, it develops this thrombus layer, but it starts to resolve earlier and ends up fully healing. Now this is a healthy animal model. It's important to point that out. Healthy animals, whether they be dogs or pigs, will tend to heal. They'll find a way to heal in general, uh, and they'll find a way to heal relatively quickly. Uh, but this is certainly the best we can do, short of testing in humans, to say this has the potential to make a, a real difference for us. And, it's, and these are animals on no oral anticoagulation and no anticoagulants. And I think it's worth pointing out that, that the, uh, the drug regimen is, is start, you know, for FlexPro is not changing or the, the label is not changing yet. It's still either um, DOAC and aspirin or, or DAPT. Um, it's still dual therapy, um, but there will be a, a monotherapy study uh, enrolling sometime this year with the hope to get us to a monotherapy, whether it be um, uh, either, I think, I don't know if it's half dose DOAC or full dose DOAC and, or aspirin only, um, which would be a big win, which could help really help with early bleeding, I think. Uh, but we saw better healing um, with the uncoated, or with the coated, I should say. And there's a publication, if you want to really get into the weeds and understand why I'm wearing a green coat, it's because of a protein binding experiment where the, the proteins show up green on the, on the coated, um, there's, there's a publication also that, that's got a lot, it talks about our protein binding, uh, getting deeper into blood, blood loop and looking at platelets, um, the three-day dog study, and we even did a 90-day pig study um, to look at endothelial cell functionality and saw more, more functional endothelium on the coated than on the uncoated. So there's a lot of work that went into this, a lot of science behind it. But fundamentally, practically speaking, we put it in our most challenging animal model. And all you have to do is look at these. All you, you really don't need to be a trained person, because I'm not very trained, frankly, um, to know that this looks better than this. And this is the key, I think, takeaway. And this is our hope that regardless of what drug regimen you put the patients on, this gives them a better chance to uh, heal uh, more consistently uh, with this new device. Any, any questions? What does anticoagulation do to this process? Have you tested how it looks with and without anticoagulation? Uh, yeah, we've, so we've looked at um, DAPT. We, we've done a, so there was a, a a GLP study with, that was run um, that we had to, um, in conjunction with the FDA, to get approval for this device. Um, those animals are on DAPT. And it looked similar to, I'd say the results were similar to this. Uh, everything looked he healed well, and it was tested at 45 and 90 days in that study. Everything looked good. I would also say we had a control arm in that study with Flex, and they all looked kind of like this too. So when you put the animals on DAPT, everything looks, everything looks good. We also tested on 
um, a DOAC, I think it was the RELTO. Um, and again, it, it, it looks kind of like this. We only did three animals in that study. Um, and I would say there was, again, a, a clear effect of the, of the Zarelto on the amount of thrombus buildup. Like we saw less thrombus buildup even than we would see in the non-anticoagulated model. So if I go back here, you know, we kind of see a little bit of this growth here, which is really not too concerning. We didn't really see any of this when we had them on Zarelto. So the Zarelto definitely had a, uh, an impact, but then when we looked at, at 45 days, um, the healing looked pretty similar to what we see here. So that's, I mean, that's, that, and that's, a, I, I've started seeing the initial results from the, um, uh, heal LAA. There's a Heal LAA study where we're looking at, I think, a certain number of patients who get the Flex Pro, and they're on. Some are on DOAC and aspirin. Some are on DAPT. And generally, I think we're seeing a lot of the a lot of results that look comparable to the Flex. So it looks like there's no uh, real positive or negative impact of drug regimen with with the new coating. So uh, I'll touch a little bit on DRT on my, in my talk as well, but most of the DRT that you found in the Watchman FLX were after 45 days. So did you have a longer term follow-up of six months or a year with this co a new coating? With the dogs? Mm -hmm. No. Um, I don't think it's relevant because I, I don't think you're going to see a late DRT in a, in a healthy animal. Um, because they get to a point where they're basically, the device is healed. And I think most of these late DRTs, um, really, it's, it's, they're generally in patients who are on uh, a DOAC for 45 days, and then they take them off abruptly. And the device probably isn't fully healed at that point in a lot of these patients. And so a couple percent, you know, one or two percent develop a DRT, I think, at that point. Uh, so the in terms of no, the only thing we could probably do is probably implant in the dogs, have them on a DOAC for like ten days maybe, and then take them off before it's fully healed and see what happens. Right. See if there's like a kind of a rebound effect. But uh, that's again, I don't know how how clinically relevant it is to look late in in these animals. Very interested in your talk, though, because I need to I need to learn a lot more about DRT. So. All right, thanks, everyone. Thank you, Ed, for a great talk. Um, my name is Che, as Dr. Gessel mentioned. Uh, I'm going to briefly cover device-related thrombus after left atrial appendage occlusion. So, why is this important? So left atrial appendage occlusion, as we know, has emerged as a significant alternative to oral anticoagulation in patients with non-valvular AFib, and the procedural volumes have gone up significantly annually all across the country. So although many studies have confirmed the safety and efficacy of left atrial appendage occlusion, certain issues do remain with the procedure. And because the volumes are going so high, and plus we are involving lower risk patients, it is very important for us to make sure that the device is safe and efficacious. DRT, or device-related thrombus, is the Achilles heel for left atrial appendage occlusion. And it continues to represent a conundrum because of the uncertainty surrounding its pr prediction, detection, and management. There is no unified definition of DRTs. I went over all the uh, LAO trials that were done, mainly the PROTECT and the PREVAIL AF, and there is no consensus definition of DRT, underscoring how ambiguous it is to diagnose and treat DRT in this patient population. And as I mentioned earlier, 
accurate diagnosis of DRT is very critical to avoid the thromboembolic complications which arise because of DRT. Uh, whereas if we overdiagnose DRT based on TE and CT, then it might lead to irrelevant intensified anticoagulation um, with either warfarin or a DOAC for an extended period of time with an increased risk of bleeding because these patients are already at a significantly higher risk of bleeding to begin with. So how do we assess DRT? Uh, TEE and nowadays CT has become the primary imaging modality for pre-procedural and post-procedural follow-up for all these Watchman patients. And uh, the main consensus came out of a retrospective study of the PROTECT AF trial where they evaluated TEE imaging for all these Watchman patients and an expert panel developed five criteria for the diagnosis of TR uh, DRT on TEE which mainly included an echo density on the left atrial aspect of the device, which was not explained by an imaging artifact, which was inconsistent with the normal healing or device incorporation, which was visible in multiple different TE projections, namely 0 degrees, 45, 90, and 135, which we usually use for our Watchman patients. The echo density was in contact with the Watchman device and it exhibited independent motion. So this was the five criteria that they used for TEE assessment of DRT in the PROTECT AF trial. And moving on to CT, because we routinely do CT at MHI for our post-procedure follow-ups, and this was a unified classification which came out of a study a few years ago, and they looked at hypoattenuated thickening, which is extrapolated from our HALT studies in post-TAVR patients, and it is a similar concept. Uh, and they graded the HAT, or hypoattenuated thickening, into grade zero, which was mainly subfabric, grade one, was if the HAT was sessile and less than three millimeters, or more than three millimeters, but it was continuous with the LA wall, it was more laminar, and it was a smooth surface. Grade two was when it was sessile more than three millimeters and there was no continuity with the LA wall, or it had an irregular surface, and grade three was when it was pedunculated. And grade zero and grade one were considered as low-grade HAT and grade two and grade three were considered as high-grade HAT. And then we wondered, which patients do we treat? Do we treat all these patients with grade zero to grade three HAT, or do we restrict our treatment to grade two and grade three? So there was a study which came out last year in EAJ uh, where they looked at cardiac CT following Watchman implantation in 244 patients, and they compared the eight-week CT scans with the imaging and histopathology in canine models. And wh what they found was that the grade zero and grade one HAT, which was mainly the subfabric and the more laminar HAT on CT, was mainly considered as low-grade HAT, and they thought that that was mostly representative of benign device healing and should not be considered as DRT and should not be treated with an extended period of anticoagulation. However, the grade two and grade three HAT was mostly representative of DRT and should warrant further clinical consideration and extension of anticoagulation to the six-month phase. Now, moving on to the incidence predictors and the clinical impact of DRT. So, the incidence of DRT varies considerably among published studies because of the variability in the frequency and standardization of post-LAO surveillance imaging. In PROTECT AF and the PREVAIL trials, the incidence of DRT was 3.7%, which is consistent with most of the other registries, the CAP and the CAP2 registries, and also the meta-analysis which have been done, including multiple different observational and randomized control trials, and the usual incidence of DRT is, among, is around 2 to 4%. In the prospective Pinnacle FLX registry, which included the second version of the Watchman device, the DRT rate had gone down to 1.7%. And I'll go over the few differences between the first and the second generation Watchman device, which probably led to the decrease in the DRT rate. And I'm excited with the new Hemoco technology, which I think will further decrease the incidence of DRT. In a meta-analysis of 10,000 patients, which was done on, uh, after a Watchman implantation in 66 studies, the pooled incidence of DRT was 3.8%, which kind of correlates with the other studies which have been done, which showed the incidence around 2 to 4%. 
And these are just a few differences between the first and the second generation Watchman device. And Ed has gone over extensively about the coating. And I think one of the major reasons why the Pinnacle FLX showed a decreased incidence of DRT was this polyester permeable fabric, which reduced the metal exposure with a central cove hub, which resulted in decreased incidence of DRT. Plus, the design has made the device much more safe and efficacious and results in a complete seal of the device, which results in decreased peri-device leak and eventually decreased incidence of DRT as well. And again, referring to that meta-analysis from our Mayo colleagues, which involved 66 studies, the DRT diagnosis was made at less than 30, uh, less than 90, 90 to 365 days, and more than 365 days, and in 42, 57, and 1 percent of patients respectively, which just tells us that how variable the diagnosis and the incidence of DRT is, and most of the DRTs happened after 45 days because our standard IFU for Watchmen is doing a TE at 45 days, but only 15% of the DRTs were actually diagnosed in that 15 in that 45 day phase, and majority of the DRTs, which was 85%, discovered after 45 days. And in the two pivotal Watchmen randomized control trials, which were the Protect and the Prevail, 29% of DRTs were actually detected on unscheduled TE examinations, which were conducted for some other reason. And despite the robust LA surveillance protocols, so in the Protect and Prevail, they did TEs at 45 days, at six months, and at one year. And even after doing such a robust TE surveillance, there were 29% of DRTs which were diagnosed outside the surveillance protocol. This implies that even frequent routine surveillance will likely miss a non-negotiable percentage of DRTs and highlights the challenges of determining an optimal surveillance protocol following LAO, especially in patients who are at higher risk for DRTs. And which patients are at higher risk of DRTs? So there were multiple studies looking at what are the independent predictors of DRT post-watchman implantation. And the studies compared the different factors and grouped it into non-modifiable and modifiable predictors. And the only consistent modifiable predictor after Watchman implantation, which resulted in an increased risk of DRT, was a deep device implant. And the, and the definition of a deep device implant was more than 10 millimeters from the pulmonary vein ridge. The non-modifiable patient factors were pretty consistent. Patients who had a history of permanent AFib, history of TIA or a stroke in the past, were, had some form of hypercoagulable disorder or an iatrogenic pericardial effusion, they were all non-modifiable patient factors. And the only modifiable patient factor was deep device implant. And based on this study, they come up, came up with a DRT risk score. And stratified patients into higher risk for DRTs or low risk for DRTs. Um, and they assigned a point for renal insufficiency for the LAO depth of implant and permanent AFib as a single point. And they put four points for pericardial effusion and a hypercoagulable state. And combined pooling all of this in together, they came up with a risk score, which included a DRT risk score of more than two gives you a 2.1% higher risk of DRT post-implantation. So it is very crucial to identify this higher risk patient population, which probably will translate into an extended period of anticoagulation post-watchman and more, uh, more robust surveillance for these patients post-watchman implantation. And what is the clinical impact of DRT post-watchman? And all the studies have consistently shown that there has been a significant increase in stroke or systemic embolism in patients with DRT compared to patients who do not have DRT, which translates into an increased MACE, which is mostly attributable to a stroke and a, a systemic embolism risk. Just briefly touching on antithrombotic therapy post-watchman, and most of the trials, this is just a, a table of uh, showing all the major trials which have been done for watchman, and the standard anticoagulation or antiplatelet regimen post-watchman device is aspirin plus a DOAC or warfarin for six weeks, and then we'll do a TE at six weeks or a CT at six weeks, and if there is no significant peri-device leak, or DRT, then we drop the DOAC or warfarin and continue aspirin for six, aspirin plus Plavix for six months. And then after six months, we'll drop the Plavix and continue aspirin 81 milligrams indefinitely in these patients. 
And this is a protocol that we follow at MHI routinely. In most patients who are not at significantly high risk of bleeding and can tolerate a DOAC or warfarin for 45 days, we'll do a DOAC or warfarin plus aspirin for 45 days. Then we'll drop the DOAC or warfarin and continue aspirin and Plavix for six months and eventually we'll go to aspirin 81 alone. In patients who are significantly high risk of bleeding, we will do aspirin plus Plavix for six months to begin with and not include a DOAC or warfarin in the regimen. And after six, mo after six months, we'll drop the, asp uh, drop the Plavix and do aspirin uh, indefinitely. So just to give an overview of DRT post uh, left atrial appendage occlusion, uh, the incidence is usually around 2 to 4% within the first year post Watchman implantation, which translates into a 2 to 4% fold high risk of thromboembolism. There are different predictors for DRT, which can be grouped as modifiable and non-modifiable patient factors. The non-modifiable ones are the ones which have patients who have permanent AFib, history of TIA or stroke, uh, renal insufficiency, hypercoagulable state, decreased EF, and the mo main modifiable factor was deep device implant. And we did touch upon the, the DRT classification based on CT, which can, be, which can group patients into low-grade DRT, which is grade 0 and grade 1, and high risk of DRT, which is grade 2 and grade 3. And if we do have DRT, then we need to extend anticoagulation for a total of six months, repeat imaging at, at the six-month phase, and if there is resolution of DRT, which most of the DRTs did resolve at six months in most of the trials, uh, then we can drop the anticoagulation at the six-month phase and then go back to aspirin alone. Thank you, and happy to take any questions. I asked everybody to have a, little, a quick talk, and they did a fantastic job. Now we have extra time. Uh, almost never happens. Um, but yeah, I, I appreciate both uh, more brief talks so that we have time for discussion, because I felt that there were a lot of questions in, in, in our own community about this. So hopefully these questions arise today, because we can answer them. Um, I also feel like uh, what you pointed out, and what uh, I think Ed pointed out somewhat too, is yes, it's a rising procedure in the amount of procedures we do. It's relatively easy, right, as you pointed out. Um, but what I've seen is also, you know, many people come and, and, you know, really don't have a significant reason for not being on a blood thinner, but feel like this is this therapy that gets them off something that might in the future risk some bleeding, and I totally understand that from a patient perspective, but when I, of course, look at both of your talks, there are some risks that, uh, you know, come with a device implant, and it, it may, you may buy a much higher risk of stroke by an implanting, implanting a device, right, that didn't go as well as planned, right? Obviously, we never plan on that, but we also, all of us, not perfect, right? So I, th I think that's also important that we still stay with the indications and not say this is perfect, let's get rid of uh, oral antifibrillation. That's just my thought. Um, any more questions? I think I'll use the microphone. Well, uh, this is really provocative uh, to, to listen to this, and I'm just wondering, if Ed, how do you reconcile the, the late DRT with the endothelialization of the device? Um, I mean, it, it seems as though you're proposing that the endothelialization is anti and protection from thrombus formation. And yet we see this late onset. I'm curious as to what mechanisms might be. The mechanism of late versus early thrombus, is it different? I, I asked both of you that question. Yeah, I think, oh, I'll just use my, uh, so uh, I think. You got, uh, you got dual microphones. I know. <laughs> Um, I am not sure if there, uh, if the most of the study did not find a significant uh, factor which, which could uh, say that this was related to an early DRT versus a late DRT. The most important factors were patients who were not on any antiplatelet or anticoagulation after the procedure. They had a significantly higher risk of early DRT. Uh, so I did mention some of the modifiable and non-modifiable factors, but the consensus was there is no. Um, there is no identification of pathophysiology, which, uh, which most of the studies were not able to understand why there was a significantly higher risk of late DRT. 
So it's still, I think, a concept which is not very well understood. So, um, yeah, a couple points. So Jay mentioned the original Watchman device having that screw that sticks up. Um, and even in animal studies with that device, the center never really gets covered with tissue. And so you'd see about half the DRTs with that early device were just right on the center of the device, just, just growing right off it. And so that was never endothelializing, that, that region of the device. And even at that, probably 2% of, maybe 2 or 3% of patients would get a DRT on that site. So there's probably about 100% lack of healing on that surface, and a couple percent of, of those 100% are, are developing a DRT. So what, I think what we're seeing is lack of endothelialization is an increased risk, but still 95 plus percent of patients without complete endothelialization are, uh, are not developing DRTs. Uh, a lot of these patients have diabetes, tons of comorbidities. They're not, probably not gonna develop a very functional endothelium even with a perfect implant with a perfect device. So there's that also. What we're seeing in the animals is, is ideal and probably not representative of what we see. So most patients have incomplete endothelialization, which leads to a couple percent of them um, having, having a DRT. The, the thought is maybe with, um, with this coating, they're just gonna have a slightly more functional endothelium or they will develop more endothelial coverage than they might have otherwise, which will, there'll still be some risk. They still won't be maybe completely healed, all of them, but it'll lower that inherent risk. So rather than two or 3% getting a DRT, maybe it's half percent or 1%. And uh, another thing is, like with that original device, you see a lot of DRTs on the center and with the Watchman Flex, I haven't really seen, I've seen very few, if any, DRTs on the center. It's generally when there's a deep, tilted implant with, with kind of a, a long limbus ridge, kind of a gutter there, and that's where the DRT is forming a lot of times. And that is potentially not even really so much device related. It's just there's so little flow there that in the blood itself, it's probably coagulating, and then it finds a, a nucleation point on the surface of, of the device to form. And that's where, with the new device, we should still be very careful about deep implantation. We shouldn't assume that we can implant any deeper or that it'll be any more forgiving. But at the same time, it might also lead to fewer of those DRTs in the gutter because it's gonna be harder for the thrombus to nucleate, hopefully, on the, um, on the device, so. So I think, <clears throat> Minneapolis Art Institute in, in many device implantations, TAVR, now with Watchman, uh, I probably forget things, but I think we're one of the very few institutions who have used our imaging capabilities and excellent researchers in that field for ever, since I'm here for eight years. So we, I think we've always been on the forefront of actually testing what the device looks like post implant with CT and not only just with the TE or something, right? So we know more about uh, halt on a TAVR device than probably 85% of the institutions, right? We, we found them on any kind of implantation device. Mm -hmm. um, and also with Watchmen, we now see things that we try to interpret in the correct way because obviously, as both of you pointed out, not everything is completely researched yet or you know defined, right? But what we definitely see when patients come back, and most of the time I get at least notifications about it, is that there's such a variation in endothelialization, right? I mean, even the nicest implants sometimes don't look great after 45 days. We see it, but we don't act right now on it because we just don't have the data to say the high bleeding risk patients should stay on anticoagulation. I mean, that would be also dangerous, right? Um, but some people look perfect, right? I mean, everything is just endothelialized and, you know, we're super happy. So just to find out what it is, and maybe we'll never find out because people are just so different in their genetics and phenotypes, so I don't know. Uh, yes, thank you everyone so much for your, for your talks this morning. We do have uh, a couple virtual questions. Uh, the first comes from Dr. John Lesser and Dr. Gessel. I think you just answered most of this, but uh, the question is, do we now use this protocol for ser serial CTs post Watchmen? Are they performed locally or elsewhere? And is, is TEE the first choice or now just used as a substitute? 
Yeah, uh, good question, and John knows the answer. <laughs> but nice, nice question. Um, yeah, so we, um, I would say, but we have four implanters. You know, the team is growing, and of course, everybody has preferences about. It. I would, I would say that most of us are okay with CT pre and post, but we're still kind of in discussion about, you know, is this really the best? Um, we, we try to do pre-imaging with CT, simply because it gives us an idea of, you know, is there something too small or too big, right? Because right now we're still a little bit limited in a too big. We have like 10 patients on a list already waiting for the 40 millimeter device, so it happens, right, that we cannot implant. Post, again, we are like discussing it, but, we're trying to do, you know, whatever the patient needs first, right? So people come from all over the place, and if, let's say, TEE is the closest to them and easiest for them to have, then we'll do a TEE. We're not forcing them to come back to a CT, but many can have a CT, so we'll try to do CT follow-up, and we'll do it in our uh, CT uh, operation. So, you know, the three places that we usually go to, Baxter and Eden Prairie and here, yeah? And obviously, with Joao, John working on this, every, the quality in all places is excellent, right? So we don't have any issues. We don't usually send people out to have a CT somewhere else, and we cannot judge the quality, right? So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you so much. There, there is a, just one more virtual question from Dr. Chavez. Uh, he says, excellent talks. Uh, larger LAA likely lead to deeper implants. Are strategies different with large LAA? Thanks. I'll let my fellow answer first. Uh, I think the strategies for implant are not different. Uh, I think with the 40 millimeter device of the Watchman FLX Pro, I think that will help with larger LAAs, um, and that will probably decrease the depth of implant as well. Uh, so I think uh, larger LAAs definitely increase the risk of DRT, but I think we'll have a bigger device also with the Watchman FLX Pro, and that will hopefully answer some of the questions with larger LAAs. And I have to say, no matter, I mean, first of all, the Watchman Flex was a huge improvement for us, right, from a implantation standpoint, and we're waiting still for that flexible sheath, too, that just doesn't appear to come out. But anyway, so, um, but I have to say, to do a very deep implant is almost impossible in most of the patients. We're always happy that we can get as deep as we can. Now, sometimes you have this huge, perfect LA and you can go wherever you want. I mean, that, I mean, in our experience, and we have done now a line wide 1600, I think, of, of, uh, of Watchmans, and we have done, I don't know, 500 here at Abbott, Northwestern, I don't know. But I think it's, it's not that common to have such space, right. you know. Now, too big, at the ostium, sure, uh, that happens, and then every now and then we have to stop a procedure because, unfortunately, with all the pre-planning, still not enough, right? But then we don't implant. Right. You know, when when we have a peri device leak post, just to maybe mention that too, is we did not have it in the implant side, right? So when we do TEE at the implantation, and there would be a huge gap, we would have to do something, right? Either not implant or take a bigger device. If we then post see it. Well, then somehow we didn't see it on that day, which is unfortunate, and we still have to interpret that too, what that means, you know, but obviously we're not trying to have a peri device leak at the uh, implantation side. Do you have any knowledge of the stroke rate here? Well, I mean, so that's also a very good question, just to make sure that everybody understands that too. We, we participate in a registry, right? So every watchman that is implanted in, in our institution, and I would say Alina White, is automatically in a registry like every other significant device, right? So, and that's abstracted independently, and we, you know, have zero, right? Zero. Yeah. So, um, I'm aware of one patient who unfortunately had an effusion, had a small leak, and then had another stroke. And I think up to um, today, no, uh, today, we don't really know what in his phenotype is so different. Um, but anyway, that's what I personally remember. But otherwise, you know, we have been lucky so far, I would say also, you know, with diligent work, everybody involved. I mean, we have, if you think about it, it's not just the implanters, right? We have so many nurse practitioners who see the patients 
in, in Postflow. One of our, some of our colleagues have to do this. You know, it's a lot of work to do this, the abstractors, the nurses behind it. And I just want to applaud those folks too. You know, our team has grown so significantly and it's not just one person, two person, three, four, five. It's usually, I would say in our group alone, you know, the 55 people who follow patients plus the sub, uh, the, the support staff. I mean, it's probably 60, 70 people that have to work, you know, in something like this. So congrats to everybody. But yeah, so far we haven't seen much of those uh, complications. But I want to think it's also for sure that um, if we have high bleeding risk patients, no matter what we try, DAPT, and we usually DAPT is where we stop, we don't use a uh, single, it's sometimes already too much. Right? So uh, two weeks later, we already get a phone call that the hemoglobin uh, sunk again. So I think to, to really work on, on getting them off anticoagulation as much as possible, that's just the goal, right? Those are the patients that that's why they come to us, not because of, you know, uh, no, no incidence of bleeding. They actually have a problem. Uh, yes, yeah, so there's just uh, two more virtual questions here. And speaking of anticoagulation, uh, Dr. Voudris asks, uh, first of all, he says, excellent presentations. Uh, the question is, uh, a question that usually comes up is whether to routinely image CT or TE, uh, TEE prior to cardioversion in patients with a watchman that have completed anticoagulation in case DRT is present. Um, the question is just any thoughts on that. Uh, so, just so I understand the question. So the question is to, uh, is there any thought on imaging with a TE or CT prior to cardioversion in patients with a previous watchman yes. who have DRT? Mm -hmm. So usually, uh, Cardioversion is not recommended at least until 30 days post watchman implant. Um, and by the time patients are ready for cardioversion, usually you'll, uh, it is recommended to get a T and CT just to make sure there's no DRT. Uh, and then uh, there was one study came, uh, which came out of Kansas which looked at uh, post uh, watchman uh, cardioversion. And there was no significantly increased risk of uh, thromboembolic events uh, post cardioversion in these patients, but they all had a T and CT done prior to cardioversion. And um, uh, Dr. Sengupta and his fellow are working right now on you know, over a thousand patients that we have to develop really protocol because it was brought up by one of our partners recently to well, how do we really do this for everybody? And I think we still have to work on that. I think, you know, we can't predict that everybody has no DRT, but, you know, if they have that DRT, does it matter if you, if you shock them? I think it's always the question, right? And is every DRT a DRT or is it the in-grow that we have seen now? I think there's so many questions, but that's why we have, you know, the center of excellence to look into that question. And then hopefully we get to come up with a question. But yeah, it's of course also important, right? Because it's, uh, you know, we can save um, a lot by, by not doing the TE and just do the cardioversion. It would be ideal if we had a result that, that would show that would save a lot of staffing and scheduling. Um, so there's one final uh, virtual question, um, and it's a two-parter from Dr. Murad. Uh, and the question is, is the rate of healing size dependent? It's the first part. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. The, I, I'd say the rate isn't, which means that the, the larger device will have to, it will take, should take a little longer because the healing will, and you can see in some of those animal study images at like the earlier time points, you start to see that whitish endothelial tissue grow in from the edges towards the center. So uh, the larger the diameter, the longer it will take to get to the center. That's how it happens in animals. We assume it happens that way in humans too. So in theory, it, it would take longer. So a 20 millimeter versus a 40 millimeter you would presumably take twice as long, um, assuming everything comes from the edges. So, but there hasn't been, as far as I've seen, much associated, association between device size and, and DRT rates. It's, it's minimal at, at best uh, difference, and generally not a, not a big predictor of DRT. Thank you. Uh, so the last question, uh, again from Dr. Murad, asks, uh, most common CT finding is perils opacification without DRT. 
any evidence that stopping OAC with that CT finding results in delayed DRT. Distal part of the LA, I do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think what, so I think that that brings up this this big thing, right? So again, we are I think at the forefront by doing so much imaging after a device implantation without really having necessarily completely established definitions, right? So when you do that, then of course you run the risk of finding something that you have to still explain, right? And that's what our group is doing right now, and it's very fruitful and you know, diverse discussions about it. Our interpretation is simply if the endothelialization is not perfect, which in many patients it won't, right, at 45 days when we do the CT, then obviously there will be flow through the device and you will see the opacification. Now that by itself should not be a reason for changing your therapy because you, you find something that nobody has found before. Nevertheless, the trials haven't been done that way, right? So then we would have to do a trial and say, depending on CT findings, this is how our anticoagulation protocol is. And if we ever could participate in a trial, we would, but I think we don't know that yet. So that's something we probably, I think I would say as, as a group have decided not to take as a significant finding, just because that's clear that that's gonna happen. The peripervice delete, I think he asked, asked that question too. That's also a big question, right? Because sometimes on CT we have much more detail than we have on TEE, and that's what I indicated before. You might think you had a perfect implantation on TEE during the procedure, comes back 45 days and there's a little leak that you didn't see on C uh, TEE because you sliced through whatever, three views, right? Um, again, we take it as done by the trials, five or less, we still continue with the protocol. If it's much more than that, which, you know, again, luckily it doesn't happen very often, we have to decide if we have options of coiling or any other uh, or continuation of intercoagulation. Uh, that's how we take it right now. But again, even in that part of pervivorous release, I think Dr. Cheng, Dr. Tabakante, every imager, we're still looking into that too. What does that really mean, right? And, and how do we interpret uh, that correctly uh, also? It's, it's just not super easy to incorporate CT right now as it wasn't really done in the, in the studies. You know? time. Well, thank you very much. I mean, I, I really appreciate that you guys had brief talks to the point and now a fruitful discussion. Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs>